Hello, you're watching Eye on Africa. I'm James Creedon. These are our headlines from across the continent this evening. Ivory Coast has suffered its first Islamist attack since 2016, with at least uh, 10 dead on the border with Burkina Faso. Those deaths follow efforts uh, to purge an Islamist presence in the border region. And what do Africans think about calls for statues uh, commemorating slave traders to be taken down? Unsurprisingly, many think it's a good idea. Stay tuned for some reactions. And overfishing by foreign trawlers has left uh, many coastal communities in Senegal struggling to survive. But now dozens of mostly Chinese ships have been banned from Senegal waters. Uh, more on that later on in the show. Thanks for watching. Now we start in West Africa with trouble on the border between Ivory Coast and Burkina Faso. Suspected jihadists attacked an army post with at least 10 people dead. The attack took place along the Komoe River that divides the two countries. Uh, in this same zone, a joint operation to flush out jihadists took place last month with scores captured and eight fighters killed in that operation. Now, last night's, last night's attack was likely a reprisal. France 24's Léane de Bassompierre sent us this update from Abidjan. The attack took place at three in the morning and targeted an army post in the northeast of Ivory Coast on the border with Burkina Faso. We managed to speak to one of six soldiers who were repatriated to Abidjan in the wake of the attack. He told us 12 of his colleagues were killed. Defence Minister Hamid Bakayoku has since assured that the area has been secured when he met them on the tarmac. We had information on threats regarding drug traffickers linked to terrorists who wanted access to our harbour zone. Ivory Coast was of interest to them. We took action, but we'll have to assess what happened regarding this attack. And we are going to reinforce protection of borders and airspace. This surveillance will, I am sure, lead us to the assailants who did this. The attack comes barely three weeks after a joint operation between Ivorian and Burkina Bay forces in which at least eight suspected militants were killed, 38 others arrested and a base destroyed. This latest attack could therefore be seen as a reprisal, making it the first terror attack since the Grand Bassam attacks in 2016. Now, last week, a focus was put on King Leopold II of Belgium and uh, the colonial brutality in DR Congo under his rule that left some 10 million people dead. His statues were targeted by protesters in Ghent and elsewhere, and there has since been a domino effect. In several countries, there are calls for statues commemorating slave traders to be taken down. What do Africans think of the trend? We've put together some reactions from the streets of Dakar, Kinshasa, Ouagadougou and Pretoria. Let's take a listen. The mass protests against racism in the United States have had repercussions worldwide. In Bristol, the statue of a slave trader was removed and thrown into the river by activists. In Antwerp, the statue of Leopold II, who colonized Congo, was removed. What do Africans feel about this? In Dakar, there were mixed reactions. In Ouagadougou, many are in favour of the removal of these statues. C'est une bonne chose parce qu'actuellement nous voyons que nous avons été victimes de plein d'injustices qui se sont passées en Afrique. Pour moi, euh, elle mérite euh, de rentrer dans l'oubli dans de la mémoire collective et euh, ça participe d'une sorte de dépollution de nos imaginaires. Et je pense que c'est très convenable. Il faut euh, réoutiller nos imaginaires avec des figures euh, de paix, des figures positives. In Kinshasa, the Congolese have not forgotten the consequences of the Belgian colonization. Aujourd'hui, la Belgique est construite sur base des ressources africaines, des ressources congolaises, de l'exploitation des peuples congolais. Je pense qu'enlever les statues de Léopold II ne va rien changer. Ça ne va, va pas compenser toutes les pertes. Ce n'est pas une bonne idée, parce qu'il euh, faut tenir compte de l'histoire. Parce qu'il y, 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 euh, y a encore des petits-enfants qui auront vraiment besoin de cette histoire-là. In Pretoria, the word killer was sprayed on the statue of Paul Kruger. More than a century ago, the Africana leader played a major role in entrenching white minority rule over the majority black population. People were killed is literally 
they, they like never like this. I feel like we should replace it. I don't think we should necessarily take it down. Yeah, I don't, I don't think that because it's a reminder of something that happened in the past and something we should avoid in future. The debate surrounding these statues is taking place all over Africa and is far from over. Uh, time for a uh, catch up on some other news stories uh, from across uh, the continent. It's a landmark decision that could radically change South Africa's political landscape. The country's top court says you no longer have to be a member of a political party to run for parliament. Civil society groups brought the case uh, that will now see uh, citizens voting directly for their lawmakers. Previously, voters cast their ballot for political parties. Now, parliament has been given 24 months to implement the ruling, but there are fears that major parties are likely to resist changes to the status quo. Malawi has set a date for a rerun of its presidential election. Uh, the vote will go ahead on the 23rd of June. Last year's vote was annulled with the Constitutional Court going up against President Peter Mutarika. They cited grave and widespread irregularities. President Mutarika will square off against Lazarus Chakwera. He's uh, the main opposition leader who came a close second last time out. Now, it's the latest in a scandal that has rocked Lesotho, a kingdom enclave within South Africa. The former Prime Minister Thomas Tabane made a down payment to assassins to kill his estranged wife. A police affidavit says a sum of 21,000 euros was paid towards the murder three years ago. This in the midst of a bitter divorce between the two. Police have said they found Tabane's mobile number in communication records from the crime scene. And in DR Congo, the president's chief of staff could face 20 years behind bars. Prosecutors have asked a high court for the stiff sentence for Vital Camere. Uh, he's uh, alleged to have been involved in embezzlement of more than 44 million euros of public funds. Rather. Uh, the case has gripped the nation with the trial being broadcast on TV. Uh, Camare has been a top power broker in Congolese politics for decades. It's staying in uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo. It's the second worst affected country in the world when it comes to food insecurity. Uh, that means a lot of suffering and a lot of hunger. And on top of this, the COVID-19 pandemic highlighted an over-dependence on food imports. Yet the country has 80 million hectares of arable land, only 10% of it being cultivated. Uh, there's more and more talk of moving towards self-sufficiency. Our correspondents Clément, Clément Bonnero and Juliette Dubois report. You'd be lucky to find any Congolese products at this market in Kinshasa. Most foodstuff is imported. In the DRC, 80% of food products come from abroad. Yet just a few kilometers from the Congolese capital, fertile land stretches as far as the eye can see. Only a fraction of it is cultivated, and yields are low because farmers have no irrigation system. In addition to limited mechanization, farmers' organizations denounce the lack of access to finance for farmers. Il n'y a pas de banque agricole pour financer les activités des de petits paysans ou bien des paysans en général. Ça, ça fait que euh, les, les producteurs n'arrivent pas à, à s'acheter des, des intrats de qualité, des semences de qualité. Harnessing the country's agricultural potential was one of President Félix Tshisekedi's campaign promises. The Congolese government has announced a $4 billion stimulus package to develop the sector. Depuis l'indépendance, ou bien avant, on a concentré tous les efforts sur les mines. On a oublié qu'il y avait des soins, on a oublié qu'il y avait des populations. Eh bien, cette ambition-là, nous voulons la réaliser maintenant, que les sols prennent la place des sous-sols. In 2019, the DRC spent only 3% of its budget on agriculture. Yet, according to the UN, the country could feed up to 2 billion people worldwide. Senegal's fishermen have won a battle in the long fight against foreign fishing trawlers. Dozens of mostly Chinese industrial fishing boats have been denied access to Senegalese waters. The decision follows a campaign led by environmental activists, Senegalese ship owners, as well as coastal communities. Fishing along Senegal's 700 kilometres of coastline provides a living for half a million people. But in recent years, fishermen are forced further and further out to sea to catch anything at all. This from our team in Dakar. 
The fishing wharf in Dakar seafront neighbourhood of Yoff is one of the most important in the capital. These men come from a long line of fishing families, but times have never been this tough. Mbai is devastated by his catch today. He blames it on unfair competition. Fishermen are not the only ones sounding the alarm. At Sumbadun port, Adam Agay makes a living cleaning and drying fish, but her incomes plummeted as fish stocks have declined. Two sea breams cost me 2,500 francs. It's much more expensive than before. The fish is overpriced. Faced with this situation, fishermen are now asking the state to change its policy and give the advantage to the national fishing industry rather than helping foreign fisheries meet their needs. They want transparency on fishing licenses and claim foreign vessels that fly the Senegalese flag leads to overfishing. When questioned on this issue, the Department of Fisheries didn't respond to our request for an interview. But for this environmentalist, there's a real urgency. Si on continue à donner des licences de pêche, à signer des accords de pêche sur des espèces surexploitées, on arrivera à vraiment à, à la catastrophe. On arrivera à la catastrophe sur le plan de la sécurité alimentaire et puis on va mettre au chômage beaucoup de professions de la pêche. Et même finalement, l'État ne pourra plus tirer de rente sur la ressource halétique parce que le jour qu'il n'y aura plus rien ici, tous les bateaux qui étaient sénégalisés vont rebrousser chemin et nous laisser notre désert liquide. After a joint campaign between fishermen and environmentalists, Senegal has now decided to deny its waters to at least 54 foreign trawlers. All right, that brings us to the end of this edition of Eye on Africa. Thank you for watching and good night.